And so the, now we're going to turn over the program to a panel to discuss what was presented, their thoughts, what might be uh, added to what was presented. And the chair of the panel is Eric Granholm. He's a professor and a chief of psychology at the VA. He has also been a co-section chief uh, regarding uh, psychosocial rehab at the VA. He's been with our department uh, for, uh, he'll tell us how many years, but wonderful work, wonderful work in pupillometry as it relates to a variety of conditions, and a, a wonderful collaborator and colleague. And I will leave it up to him to introduce people on the panel. Uh, yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry. I've been here 26 of our 50 years, actually. Um, even before I joined the faculty, I worked with Nelson Butters in uh, the Boston VA as an undergrad. And when he was recruited here in 1983, he said, hey, you want a job in San Diego? I'm in. So I finished undergrad and I drove across the country and worked here for a couple of years before I went away to grad school at UCLA. And Nelson, who was a fantastic mentor and really took care of his students uh, well, um, recruited me back, which is to say got me a cool job here as an assistant professor. Uh, in 1993, and I've, it's my only real job. So uh, I've liked it that much, and I'd like to echo one of, um, I think it was Mark's comments. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. It's a great department to be a clinical psychologist. We have a PhD program in clinical psychology in our department, large internship, postdocs. I have graduate students in, uh, in my lab who are getting their degree in our department, and the collaboration between MDs and PhDs uh, is really fantastic to be a psychologist here. My own, jour own journey has been at the VA. I've, I've worked there at various clinical programs and now uh, I'm the chief of the, the service over there for the past few years uh, following Susan Tapert. Um, uh, I'll say a couple of comments. I'm going to introduce the panel, say a couple of comments, and then we'll each take turns saying some comments. We have till 10 after 12. After we talk a little bit, we're going to open it up for uh, discussion from the audience. But on our panel today, we have Greg Light in the first chair. He is a uh, professor of psychiatry and deputy vice chair of psychiatry uh, education and training in our department. Um, as he puts it, he's homegrown. Uh, Greg joined the department in 1995 as a, a PhD graduate student in the program I just mentioned, our joint doctoral program with SDSU. And uh, he stayed on for internship and then a fellowship in our biological psychiatry uh, fellowship program and then joined the faculty in, in 2003. And uh, next to him, we have Neil Richtan, who is a professor of psychiatry and attending psychiatrist in the college mental health program that Nancy Downs runs. Um, and he joined the department as a resident in 1988, so he's also been around a long time. And over the years, he's been an investigator in both clinical and preclinical research studies related into in schizophrenia. All of our panel are involved in schizophrenia research, obviously. And next, we have uh, Susan Powell, who's a professor of psychiatry and research scientist at the VA. She joined in 2007. And her research focuses on preclinical studies of neurodevelopmental risk factors uh, for schizophrenia and autism, as well as hallucinogen pharmacology and antipsychotic drug development. And as you saw in the talks, at least uh, two of our panelists have participated a lot in the other labs where the research uh, we, we just heard from, uh, uh, from our speakers. And I'd like to uh, start by talking about that influence of those uh, speakers uh, in the Braff, Geyer, Swerdlow, Cadenhead uh, lab. Um, this group uh, and, and several of our panelists, and actually you saw a list of people, I think there's at least 10 people who are on our faculty who came out of this uh, group as well. So they've had a tremendous influence on the research here, but also uh, nationally. When I myself came here in 93, um, I had to make the trip the, to Mecca and go down to Hillcrest and um, learn how to do schizophrenia research and get grants here. And um, everyone said, that's where you have to go. I used to go to the lab meetings down there. Dave was a co-investigator and helped me write my first R01. Um, and so everybody sort of goes there to learn how to do this stuff. Um, and it has tremendous impact. Um, uh, 
uh, I just did some quick searches um, uh, on the web. Um, the, if you add up the publications, and I did take out overlapping because they co-author things together, there's almost a thousand publications have come out of this, the speakers that you just heard. Which, and many, many of those were cited hundreds of times. You know, I think one was 700. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of citations for these. Uh, these are high impact and many, many articles coming out. And if you just type in the, the, everyone's name, so and so, or, 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 you know, on uh, Google Scholar, Scholar, you're going to get over 23,000 hits. So these are people's citing the papers and they just come up uh, over and over. So this work um, has had a uh, tremendous impact and maybe my biggest mistake in, when I came here is I don't do pre-pulse inhibition work. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I learned in that lab, Dave has a, a, a cool slide about uh, sort of life, the universe, and everything, if you're a Hitchhiker's Guide uh, fan, where pre-pulse inhibition, of course, isn't the center of this slide. Then there's arrows going down to circuits, to pharmacology, and then down to genes. And we heard about a lot of the research on that pathway drilling up and down between pre-pulse and those genes. Um, and um, on the other part of the slide, uh, it goes up to broader cognitive concepts beyond information, early information processing, which is what I used to do when I went, it was going down there. Um, and then up to broader cognitive abilities, and then things, you know, uh, the concepts get bigger, you know, motivation, and then ultimately real world functioning is, is the, really the holy grail, right? How can we improve the lives uh, of these people uh, with schizophrenia? And um, sort of, I used to think, you know, where, where does my information processing work fit, fit in, my psychophysiological work? And I really uh, appreciated that, those kind of big picture uh, thinking. Um, over the years, my own work has moved more toward the top of that, uh, that diagram um, and uh, working on um, really psychosocial interventions or psychotherapy for people who have uh, schizophrenia. Um, and in our department, that's actually a pretty popular thing to do. Um, and several uh, investigators work in this area in our department. Um, 32 people on our website list schizophrenia as a research interest, which is a lot of people. And 10 of them uh, I know of or said on there um, actually work in psychosocial kinds of interventions or what um, people often call non-pharmacologic interventions, which is a name I really don't like because there's like pharmacologic and then other. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, there's a lot of people um, who are doing this kind of work. Um, we saw in Dr. Cadenhead's uh, work um, some cognitive remediation, um, doing a CBSST trial for ultra high risk with her. Um, she's working with Beth Twomley, who's another investigator in our department who does cognitive compensatory training, which is a form of cognitive remediation it's done in a group therapy kind of classroom like setting. Um, she also does supported employment um, uh, interventions. Best practice guidelines for schizophrenia re recommend CBT, social skills training. Uh, Cognitive, cognitive remediation isn't quite in there yet, um, but I'm positive it will be in the next round. Supported employment. These are interventions that are helping people up at the, um, uh, at the real world functioning level, intervening uh, up there. Um, I myself developed that intervention that Kristen mentioned called Cognitive Behavioral Social Skills Training with John McQuaid, who was here and was associate chief of our psychology service, and now he runs the mental health care line at the San Francisco VA, and he's at UCSF. But we, he's a CBT guy, and I'm a social skills training guy, and we got together and bundled this into cognitive behavioral social skills training, which really targets um, negative symptoms and functioning in people with schizophrenia. And we've done eight VA or NIMH funded trials of that now, and in every single one, functioning improved relative to various uh, controls, various ways of trying to shorten and strengthen the intervention. Um, and uh, motivational negative symptoms also improved. And I think part of this pathway that David's diagram reminds me of is there's a model about why CBT helps people improve their lives. And it's, it's basically, if you have a lot of cognitive impairments, you're going to have a lot of failure experiences in life. And uh, because if you can't remember things and learn as well, like you might not get as, your grades might be, not be as, as good, you might not do well at work, 
If you start to have a lot of failure experiences in your life, you're going to expect to fail. Why bother trying? I've already failed. Uh, I'm not going to get an A. I'm going to fail the class again. Things are going to go wrong. If this happens to you, if you're lonely and isolated and you don't do well socially, you can start to think things aren't going to work out. And that can deplete your motivation. And that's like a motivational negative symptoms. And we know that that's a big contributor, whether people try and go to work or try to change their lives. So CBT is a great, uh, that's what CBT does is changes thoughts, change your thoughts to change your life. And that's really um, sort of the level of that diagram where, where we're working in my lab. Tom Patterson did functional adaptive skill training. Greg Light does computer-based and other kinds of cognitive rehabilitation interventions. Dimitri Perivoliotis does CBT for psychosis, trained with Aaron Beck. Dilip Jesty does different kinds of psychosocial interventions, including a current one he's running to intervene with board and care workers to improve diet and exercise and reduce metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Colin Depp and I do a lot of work together on mobile interventions for people with schizophrenia. And I want to thank Igor for the great idea to start a mental health, uh, a center for mental health and technology here at UCSD. We just launched it last year. It's a MH Tech Center. And what it does is um, takes technologies from the, J we partner with the Jacobs School of Engineering to get their technologies and bring them to bear on mental health problems. So, um, Colin and I have been doing that work for a while with smartphone apps that intervene with people in the real world, prompt pleasurable activities, question thoughts, and combine those with those psychosocial interventions. Um, there's other investigators at that center, like Fiza Singh, are doing some pretty cool things with neurofeedback to improve cognition um, and virtual reality uh, interventions for social skills. But I just I uh, wanted to rush through some of the many projects for the, the 10 investigators I noticed on the website who are doing these, these uh, uh, types, this type of schizophrenia research at this other level of analysis than we heard in the, uh, in the talks. Um, and at this point, I'd like to open it up to our panelists. Um, thank you to Mark and Pat and uh, Mark Geyer and the other organizers for inviting me to serve on this panel. Um, I think one of the themes that we'll see from uh, the three days of sessions is that UCSD is a great environment to work in. And um, we've, we've had a tour de force of schizophrenia so far. But I think part of the environment beyond the research is also the clinical training environment and um, the, the, obviously the people that work across different settings. And so for me, as a graduate student coming here in 95, working with the presenters um, or earlier, um, it's been great to have such a, a group of mentors and colleagues and to be able to study these trenchant illnesses like schizophrenia in real world settings, in the inpatient unit, in the outpatient clinic, and to get their insights on, on next steps. I think one of the problems that we're faced with is our diagnosis and treatment decisions are based largely on a person's self-reports of their complex inner experiences. And despite our advances in neuroscience, we are not yet using those tools of neuroscience in any meaningful way in those clinics to inform our treatments. And so it's been a real pleasure to be able to be here and to try to start infusing those tools in both drug development applications as well as in clinical settings to try to improve the outcomes for our patients. Thank you. Well, I also want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting us and for setting up uh, really, really nice talks. Um, and uh, just a, a few very brief comments. I think one of the things that, um, you know, that Eric noted was the degree to which the, the four members who gave talks are, have really been pioneers in the world of schizophrenia research. And I think the, the couple of things that, that really showed through the, the, what, the data was how relentlessly persistent um, this group has been in moving the world of science forward. Um, a, another 
unrelated uh, topic, maybe maybe related to the word pioneer, was a quote uh, from David Siegel that I'll, I'll never forget. I was very fortunate to do my uh, fellowship with uh, m multiple mentors, Mark Shuckett, uh, John Kelso, Ron Kaczynski, and David Siegel. And one of the things that uh, David was fond of saying was that if your experimental results turn out exactly as you expected, you didn't learn anything. Uh, but when your results were completely different from when, what you expected, that's when science really began. And uh, that, I, I was reminded of that by uh, some of the things that Neil said. But uh, that, that uh, you know, I, I wanted to bring you know, David's words of wisdom to the audience. Um, the, la the last thing I'll, I'll end with is kind of a, a question for the panel members uh, when, we, when we get to them answering questions, and that is that what they have demonstrated was, you know, over the last 50 years, uh, a tremendous amount has been learned about schizophrenia. Uh, the, and I think that the panel members have really pushed that forward. Uh, we, we know a lot more than we did 50 years ago. Treatment hasn't uh, progressed nearly as far. I remember when I was a resident, if somebody needed clozapine, you had to send them to a clinical trial in Arizona. Now we can prescribe it. But that's about all, you know, maybe that, that we have to offer patients. But we have learned a tremendous amount. And, and I wonder um, how much of that can we communicate to families, uh, you know, when they walk in for the first time or when they've been ill for some time. Um, how much of it, you know, as Greg has, point, uh, has pointed out, um, you know, the, the illness has such heterogeneity and we don't have the ability to understand uh, how many of those hundred different genes they're carrying uh, to this, uh, you know, to this, uh, and how many of the different environmental uh, factors. And so is there something more that we can offer patients in terms of all that we've learned? It's a question for the panel members. Jen, I hope you guys yeah. open it to the audience as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, we will. All right, well. I guess we could open it to the audience. <laughs> I just want to put a little plug in for the um, animal model work. Um, uh, as um, Mark and Neil, I think, demonstrated really nicely, the department has been really strong in the ability to translate the animal um, paradigms um, back and forth between animals and humans. And I just want to point out as a discussion point that we can um, focus on is how the models going forward um, can sort of mesh with what's going on at NIMH right now with the focus on learning more about circuits, you know, sort of going away a little bit from the pharmacology and how those models can inform um, our approaches um, on, on both sides. So that's all. So I'd like to invite the audience to participate in the discussion and ask questions, and I'd like to ask the speakers to come up to the podium and answer all the questions so we don't have to. <laughs> um, Dr. Luann Brizendine from UC San Francisco. I'm here with my husband, Sam Berendis, but last night we had a lovely dinner with Arnie Mandel, and we talked a lot about schizophrenia, actually. So a question between what was presented by the group this morning and some things that came up last night at dinner or about, my question is, what, if anything, in terms of cognitive improvement or even the startle, um, in schizophrenics is improved by psychopharmacology or by antipsychotics? What kinds of things are improved? Yeah, Dave, or any could take this. I mean, the, 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 the bottom line is not, not as much as we would like, um, uh, that um, you know, most antipsychotics are, are useful at controlling some of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. They keep people out of the hospital for periods of time. They keep them um, better integrated into the world. But in terms of overall cognition, the effect sizes across most multiple matrix domains, and that's the kind of the way of assessing broadly a uh, broad swath of of cognition. For most antipsychotics, they are the effect sizes are in the point one range. So, um, you know, cogni cognitive gains are not um, particularly robust. Uh, they're still necessary for um, keeping people out of the hospital, keeping them out of 
uh, you know, violent acts, uh, acting on uh, their command hallucinations or paranoia, but in terms of the overall cognitive profile, not so great. On the other hand, uh, a lot of the interventions that were mentioned up here, that Eric mentioned, um, and Greg, I'm sure, can talk about at the level of cognitive remediation and cognitive therapy, have been shown to produce uh, lasting improvements in uh, across a variety of cognitive domains, working memory, attention, vigilance, um, uh, verbal learning and memory, uh, that uh, at this point, for example, with a, a computerized cognitive remediation program that Sofia Vinogradov uh, in your program helped develop uh, and, st and is still working on, can produce effect sizes in the 0.4 to 0.6 range that last for at least two years. Uh, and uh, the challenges are that that doesn't, only about half the people that do it uh, get those gains. Uh, trying to identify them up front is one of the strategies that Greg's been using uh, in the biomarkers, and he can actually identify changes in, um, in uh, mismatch negativity and, and other markers after an hour of cognitive training uh, that will predict the long-term gains from 40, 30 to 40 hours of cognitive training. I should let Greg present his data and not present it for him, but um, those, those gains uh, in Greg's work have involved a, a few of the different cognitive domains that Sophia saw the gains in as well. And then uh, the hope is that we can then even augment that further and maybe uh, put it, produce it in uh, more individuals with pharmacology that was not designed as an antipsychotic pharmacology, but rather as a pro-cognitive pharmacology. So that's sort of a long-winded way of saying not much from the antipsychotics, effect size is quite small. Other areas of intervention, of, of life function are improved and are necessary um, uh, from those drugs, but that the big gains are probably going to come from other strategies. So, um, the, the, uh, first of all, I, m I missed the um, acknowledgement slide, especially for Joyce Sprock. What? Oh, um, I missed my acknowledgement slide. It wouldn't go, especially for Joyce Sprock, who's been with us uh, down <laughs> at CTF for many years and is, is my CPU. So um, in th the issues are, I think that uh, Lara, uh, my daughter, and I wrote this thing about the translational revolution being very early. It's very early, and I think Neil just uh, uh, illustrated that. The most agonizing things I've done, I mean, we have Ellen Sack, and we have John Forbes Nash, and we have perhaps, according to Bloiler and Kreplin, 15% of schizophrenia patients, quote, schizophrenia patients remit. We never see them. In our environment, we see the tail end of the distribution of the most uh, uh, impaired people, I think. And our research, it, 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 there's a positive and negative for doing research in that. But the worst, to answer your question, the, the most agonizing things I do is to speak with families about the, I mean, if you want heartbreak, <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if you have empathy and, uh, and connectedness to people, which I think I do, and I'm sure everyone here does, I mean, it's just <laughs> awful, because what do you say? There, there are two things. One is genetic counseling, right? I mean, with Huntington's, it's really easy. 50% chance, and people can make their decisions, and you know how complicated that is. With schizophrenia, you, you get questions about transmission with a parent, say 8% 8, 8 chance. But the other thing is what happens with a really sick uh, patient when, pa when parents and family members ask you? And you have to explain to them that this is probably going to be, you know, you see them eight years, 10 years into the illness in, in, in what I do with tertiary referrals. It's just heartbreaking. And, you know, parents cry, and uh, the resources, we don't have parity. Uh, I think it's disgraceful that the richest country in the world spends $700 billion on weaponizing and weaponizing the border, sorry to be too po political, and doesn't really care about these most disadvantaged people. It, it's, it's, it's awful, and then we have to explain why. So. The answer to that question is you have to tell people the realistic uh, 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 trajectory for the illness and then uh, send them to NAMI and to support group. We asked about family members, not, not to be. 
to, to support groups, et cetera, et cetera, who, who will, who will uh, perhaps give family members um, support. I mean, my wife does this with Alzheimer's patient caregivers and has written a book about it, and she's faced the, the same dilemma. These are often downhill courses. So this is the, what I call the knowledge to wisdom gap. We have a lot of knowledge, but we don't have an integrative wisdom yet. Uh, I don't mean to be you know, too depressive, <laughs> Actually, but I think that's the reality. Let Kristen talk. <laughs> Kristen's always Kristen talk. I'm the optimist in the group. You know, I have to say that, uh, and I'll be brief, the early phases of psychosis, I think, do have more potential when there's more brain plasticity, that if we use these interventions at that period, we may be able to prevent some of this cognitive decline that you see. Um, and I have to say, too, we've translated a lot of the research into a clinic. So we have a first episode clinic. I think Eric was actually instrumental in helping us to develop it. But it's really recovery-based. We send a lot of people back to college. We have, you know, one of, one of the sickest young women I had is in nursing school right now. You know, so we really do have great results, and I think that if you, you, you work with them young, um, I try to prevent getting on to disability um, and making sure that they're in school doing something, keeping their brains active, and we have a whole kind of youth center that we're developing uh, with you know, different cognitive training types of techniques that are available to the participants. So I think it's really an opportunity to do something. So I wanted to, <laughs> Kristen, um, are, is there any efforts with like um, pediatricians that see a big adolescent populations? Are they any screening that, that they do at that level before well, they get into your clinic? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, one of, one of the biggest challenges of research in this area is I, I really want to get all the teen programs, college mental health, various programs. There's a simple 21-item uh, screener that maps on to the diagnostic interview we use so that people that score high on it, 55%, meet the criteria to be in the study. And so I'm, I have an application in to NIMH to work with homeless youth to do the screening. I would really like to do the screening throughout the university <laughs> if it were, I mean, but again, I think it, it should be the help seeking individuals because otherwise you're casting too broad a net um, for psychosis. It's one thing to do that with depression or anxiety, but I think that if we narrow it down to help seeking, we have a good chance of finding higher numbers because mm -hmm. it's something that goes, gets missed easily. I also want to point out Mark Geyer presented some promise regarding a different approach to dealing with psychotic disorders. And I loved your comment that it's now basically applicable for people whose dopamine system should not be messed with, uh, such as individuals with Parkinson's. But I'm very excited about trying to see, uh, as you say, there's going to, it, it's, it's almost certainly going to be used off-label and it will be interesting to see what happens. But before we end, because we're, we're running a little short on time, uh, Arnold Mandel had a comment, and then I have a final comment before we head off. I'm working with uh, Steve Robinson at NIMH uh, on the MEG records, and I've been looking at them using the new uh, ergodic theory and dynamical systems, uh, sort of subtle, more subtle measures of the, of the activity. And, uh, on and off drugs and so forth. And we have several hundred cases now. And it, uh, un it, it looks like the, one of the leading uh, general defects has to do with uh, transfer of, of uh, loss of flexibility in transfer of new information. And uh, drugs make it worse. Are, are consistently. It's been tough for me because I've come aboard with a biological, very strongly biological orientation. And it's becoming clear now that putting uh, schizophrenics on drugs is a risk. And it's a judgment, isn't it? It should never be an automatic activity on the part of the clinician. You should put it in the context of, uh, that we've been hearing about, cognitive training, environmental manipulation, all kinds of things. Uh, with with a drug being in a sense not an automatic uh, uh, indicator at okay. all, and it's been tough for me to accept this 
<laughs> and uh, but we keep repeating it. Interestingly enough, the administrators at NIMH are not so eager for us to release <laughs> our data and c keep sending us back to replicate. <laughs> and we've done that three times now, and they still are uh, hesitant with a non-pharmacological thing. And I suspect there's some political action going on uh, and, uh, and lobbying and all kinds of big, big uh, behind the scenes uh, influences that may be influencing us to use drugs when we should stop a minute and, and think about doing it. We have a problem, which is uh, in order for us to stay on time and not go over 4.30, or at least not much over 4.30 in the afternoon, we have to move on and people need a break for lunch. Uh, but I want to emphasize one of the things that Arnold just said, which is, I suppose, while there may be many things that some residents who rotate through say that I'm a Johnny One note on, but another of those is that, uh, or perhaps the major one is, all medications have side effects and problems. Know what you're doing before you start the medication. Know what your goals are, when to stop or when to say it's not working. Uh, and that among those dangers, I can hardly think of medications that are potentially more deadly than the antipsychotic medications. But understand, for people with schizophrenia, with symptoms that are difficult to control, they are life-saving as well. But we, don't put, we shouldn't put people on those medications unless we have to. One more uh, uh, announcement, which is if you brought any cups in here, please uh, try to be sure you take them out or we'll uh, not make the people who run this auditorium happy. And I want to remind you this afternoon we have two <laughs> wonderful sessions. Hopefully that will generate as much discussion as this. One on mood, anxiety, sleep, stress. That's the first one after the, after the lunch, which will start uh, at 1 o'clock. And then the second on, uh, after a coffee break will be on alcohol and drugs.